All right, it's seven o'clock on the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, if you're just coming in, go ahead and say hello, introduce yourself in the chat box, tell us where you're joining us from. Um, but we will go ahead and get started. My name is Laura Nelson. I'm the project leader for the Rancher Stewardship Alliance. Um, we are just so excited to have you here and joining us this evening for our third session of our Rural Resilience Seminar Series. Um, uh, we have a lot of familiar faces in the room already that know who Rancher Stewardship Alliance is, but in case you don't, I'm going to start with a little introduction to who we are and why we're here tonight. Um, and then I'll introduce Nicole and we'll go ahead and get started. So again, if you're just joining, say hello, um, drop your name and where you're joining us from in the chat box. So um, the Rancher Stewardship Alliance, again, my name is Laura Nelson and I'm the project leader for RSA. Um, Rancher Stewardship Alliance is a rancher-led nonprofit based in Malta, mm -hmm. Montana. We've been around for about 17 years and our origin story centers around about 30 ranch families um, from South Phillips County who gathered together to solve common problems. Um, today, that still holds true. Our mission statement is ranching, conservation, and communities, a winning team. Um, Rancher Stewardship Alliance exists to help multi-generational and beginning ranchers build the collaborative, trusting relationships and community-based solutions that we need in order to create healthy working landscapes and vibrant rural communities. Now, what that means is that we believe that ranchers can feed the world, that together with friends and partners, we can preserve our prairie neighborhood, and ultimately that in doing those things, we can nurture the next generation of ranch stewards to care for this land, the livestock, and our rural communities. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is through education. Um, I just, uh, we just finished reading Nicole's book for the love of soil. And one of the quotes in here was uh, from a gentleman who said that the most important place to focus on in his ranch is in the top paddock. And that's the paddock between his ears. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that. And just coming from um, speaking for our Rancher Stewardship Alliance Board of Directors and leadership, that's something that is really important to our organization, that we're always growing, we're always learning, we always have more to learn, and that the way we learn is by sharing our successes and failures openly and by learning together in community. So that's why we're here tonight. Um, that's why we started this Rural Resilience webinar series, so that we can learn together and keep growing and be more successful in our farms and ranches and have more success in our rural communities. So with that, um, again, we have some new folks joining. Go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box. I have a few housekeeping um, items before I introduce Nicole. Um, again, we'll just say, please remain muted throughout the presentation, but that doesn't mean we want you to be silent. Um, we are going to use the chat box throughout the presentation to ask questions, offer feedback, make comments, um, and, and again, use it right now to introduce yourself. I'll be monitoring that chat box for a Q&A, and I'll moderate those questions to Nicole. Um, and again, remember this will be an interactive event. So Nicole's gonna share for a little bit here, but then we'll break into small groups into breakout rooms so that we can chat with fellow attendees. Um, we recognize that there is a broad array of experts um, in this room right now in the audience. Um, and you each have experience and expertise on your farms and ranches that you can share with each other to continue to learn. So we'll have time for um, those conversations and um, so again, please use the opportunity, use the chat box to share your thoughts and feedback as we go along. Um, and the final note before I hand it over to Nicole is just to say that we are really grateful to be able to provide these webinars for free, thanks to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and grant funding that Rancher Stewardship Alliance receives from them. Um, and if you appreciate this content and would like to see Rancher Stewardship Alliance be able to continue these kinds of educational events and forums, we would appreciate your support in the form of a donation to the organization. And, and that funding goes to, to more programs like this. And, and Angel will drop a link in the chat box to that donation page. So with that, um, I'm gonna introduce Nicole Masters. We are just thrilled to be able to host Nicole with us tonight. And, and we're really looking forward to having her in central Montana um, a little bit later in the summer for in-person events. But it is just a real pleasure and a real treat to have an evening with Nicole um, in this forum. Nicole Masters is an independent agroecologist, a systems thinker, a storyteller, and an educator. Her book, For the Love of Soil, which again, we just finished reading, 
lots of fun, um, showcases examples of the principles and tools producers are using to regenerate their soils. With over 20 years of practical and theoretical experience in regenerative agriculture, she's recognized as a knowledgeable and dynamic speaker on the topic of soil health. We'll drop a link to um, Integrity Soils in the chat box now as well, and you can learn a little bit more about her organization. Uh, Nicole's team of soil coaches at Integrity Soils works alongside producers in the US, in Canada, and across Australia supporting producers and organizations that which cover over 28 million acres take their land take their landscapes to the next levels in nutrient density profitability and environmental outcome um, and with that I'm going to turn it over to Nicole we are just so excited to have you thank you Laura that was such a cool introduction and it does feel like an evening out with RSA with your beautiful makeup and looking all gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for um, joining in on this conversation. I recognize quite a few names and recognize quite a few areas. Um, yeah, it's amazing just to see people turning up for these webinars still. Um, and the level of knowledge that I can see just in this group is quite extraordinary. So I think collectively the rest of you could actually take this presentation and I'll just sit back. Um, Right now, oh, and when you said Australia, it's, it actually says Australasia, I think, which means Australia and New Zealand. So don't forget the Kiwis, they'll get a little bit sad <laughs> if we let them out. Um, so yeah, what I'd like to dig into, sorry, um, today is uh, looking at um, some of these soil health principles. And I really would like this to be quite fluid. Like I'd like to hear um, from you and ask questions as we go. So although I've got a few slides, I think I would really prefer to just um, hear more from, from you guys. So if I can just start really just thinking about, um, you know, thinking about soil health and how do we define something like um, regenerative agriculture or, and for me, you know, this really does come back to soil health. And this was in the good old days when people used to get together and hang out around soil trenches and Man, I'm really missing it at this point. Um, this was a ranching for profit event uh, and we are on the pad Padlock Ranch. There is nothing like actually digging a hole and seeing this stuff for yourself. And what I find is so few producers actually dig holes. Um, you know, and it's our biggest investment on the planet is what we're putting into our land. And yet very few even know what they're purchasing or dig a hole to have a look. And it's blown me away because I work with a lot of incredibly progressive um, producers who often um, haven't got a shovel uh, to really take a look and see what is it that's going on under here? Like, uh, is there some kind of limitation? So many of you are brilliant um, grassland observers and you're starting to really hone those skills in terms of digging and looking underground and starting to um, have those aha moments. And I must say, I've had a couple of those this winter. I, one thing I've never really done is dig trenches in the ice, just kind of just went, well, I don't know what we would see and just kind of discourage people from doing it. And what blew my mind away this winter is digging soils that were um, overgrazed, had a lot of bare soil, um, pretty poor cover, pretty poor diversity. Um, when we dug in those soils, it was really, really hard to get the backhoe to even uh, get into the ground through the ice. And so there was probably two or three inches of ice. And they were the first holes that we dug on this trip. And I was like, oh yeah, that's kind of what I expected was that the soil would be quite frozen. Well, then we went to some properties where they had tall grass, um, longer recoveries. I'm not saying they were like, you know, managing everything perfectly, but they didn't have any ice. Like we could get those buckets through that soil and that soil was open, the roots were deep, that um, there was no limitation to water movement. And I think we, me, all of us, we have assumptions about how we see the world and we'll hear something and it's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, the ground's frozen. So when we get quick mouth, there's nowhere for it to go and we're going to end up with flash floods and that's just a given. And now like kind of having that aha, I realized it's not just a given, you know, like question all the assumptions that we have about a variety of things. So why soil health? You know, it's essential to be building healthy soils to hold on to and release nutrients and water. We want to see a soil that has that beautiful crumb structure and is full of life. And, and, you know, for many of you, it's not necessarily going to be earthworms, but things like our macroarthropods, um, ants, termites, they play that same role as what an earthworm does in um, more temperate or irrigated ground. 
Healthy soils are going to help protect against pests and diseases and optimize production. Hands up if you had grasshoppers this year. Nobody. No, no. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, grasshoppers are really indicating to us that something's out of whack and we've got to really look at what is happening with soil health. And if you think back and consider what did this environment used to look like, and if you look at a lot of cavalry kind of accounts, they talk about, um, you know, multiple streams, water running, um, wagons getting bogged, um, and it's the same in Australia. You know, there's an awful lot of accounts when colonials and people, um, Europeans first arrived into these landscapes that they were very, very hydrated. And they say in Australia it took one to two years with overgrazing with sheep for that soil to blow away, and we have no idea what these landscapes used to look like. All right, so a big part of this um, holding on to and releasing nutrients and water is about biology and having organic matter in these soils. And so uh, I don't know what your Put it in the chat. What is your organic matter? Do you know what percent your organic matter is? And I'd be really interested to hear. Um, a lot of ranches we go and have a look at uh, typically are running about half a percent to two percent organic matter. Um, and we don't have any way to kind of go back in time and see what some of these soils would be like. But they say they're typically running at about 30 percent. And I think they've been quite um, optimistic about that, but 30%. So let's say your soil may have been at 6%. What did that look like with 6% organic matter? Holding onto water and releasing it. One of the organisms that actually helps that release of water is fungi. So we want to think when we're feeding our fungi, what the fungi do, do is they take that carbon, that hydrogen and their oxygen that that, that plant um, formed to so it took sunlight energy and turns that into sugars and then makes that into the building block of everything. So it's roots and it's leaves. But when that fungi break that um, organic material down, and that might be in the form of manure, it might be um, organic material that you've trampled into the ground, the fungi will feed on that and they turn that carbon into chitin, which is how they grow. And then the hydrogen and the oxygen reacts and forms into water. So like 20% of what they break down from all that manure and all that trampling turns into free water, right? So these systems that we're now ranching on used to be very, very high in active fungi. And when we go and have a look now, very, very low fungal activity. They are, the rangelands are turned into what I call the sleepy soils. All right, so I asked about healthy soils. Uh, if you go and learn soils in university, well, 20, 30 years ago when I did, it's because it's an anchor and a habitat, right? So you're gonna, you want something for something to grow into, so that's why we need healthy soils. But they also break down and decompose stuff. You look at that rooting system, that's a buffer to climactic change. So when you dig a hole, I want you to have a look at how deep do those roots go and how dense are those roots and are those roots covered in soil? Um, and this is really what's gonna mean that you're gonna be the first one to green up and the last one to brown off and you'll probably get another flush of green later in the season. Right? We do that through having rooting systems like that. What that healthy soil is also providing through all the biological activity are what we call the secondary metabolites. So things that microbiology and plants are actually releasing. There's plant growth hormones, which microbes release, like the magic of all magic, like what some um, biology produce and earthworms produce uh, are plant growth hormones, and then things like vitamins and enzymes. And at the end of the day, it's so that we can grow healthy, nutrient-dense crops which at the end of the total day means we have an increase in resilience, production, animal health, the reduced need for inputs. And when we think about inputs um, for graziers, we're talking about things like drenches or um, uh, things for lice or foot problems or um, not chasing your tail with pink eye because we actually have animals that are healthy, which in the end of the day equals reduced costs, which equals profit, All right? This particular study, um, yeah, it was on some New Zealand, um, what we call mid grazing, managed intensive grazing or AMP, adaptive managed pastures or holistic grazing, whatever you want to call it, right? So this was that what that study was done on. So that's what I want to see your roots look like, all right? Those are what we call the Rastafarian roots or the, uh, the rhizosheath is the technical term. But in that, we are building resilience. And as a, as a result of building soil health, we have impacts that are far beyond the ranch gate. So in terms of climate regulation, we can actually geoengineer the climate by what we're doing on our landscapes, even with grass, right? So 
Grasses respire and they release moisture into the atmosphere. They release volatile organic compounds and they release microbiology, which all help to stimulate the, um, the small water cycles, right? So this part of um, climactic variability and landscapes becoming drier, part of the story is we no longer have ecosystems functioning normally, right? And we're starting to create more desertification. And some studies done in Montana and Saskatchewan actually showed that um, bare chem chemical following actually increased the atmospheric boundary layer and pushed cloud and pushed rainfall away from those cropping areas. And it reduced, it's reducing rainfall by about How rude! It's fine. <laughs> Don't panic, girls. It's all right. We'll do the rest as a mime. No, we'll be fine. <laughs> so when we're thinking about issues around water quality, so this is not only nitrogen and phosphorus, but also sedimentation. That's all about having, had, having healthy soils. Did any of you see some of the dust storms this past season? That is crazy, man. We cannot be afford, we cannot afford to keep doing that, right? Um, I thought we would have learned our lesson in the 1930s, but we are heading for some major, major dust storms um, that are predicted to get a lot worse and a lot bigger. Um, and it's not just those states that they were breaking in for wheat. Um, we're looking at this right across the country. And part of the reason for this is we do not have soils that are sticking together. Who sticks soil together? It's your fungi. All right, so fungi are what actually are building those aggregates and sticking soils together. It's not plant roots that stop soil moving, it's actually active fungi. How do we get rid of them? Overgrazing, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, soluble nutrition, um, phosphorus, all gets rid of that fungal biomass. Um, hot fires will get rid of it and flooding. So if you have waterlogged soil, say goodbye to your beneficial fungi. All right, so there's things that we do to kind of undermine this whole structure that we're trying to build. Right. Um, food quality obviously comes down to um, soil health and then human well-being. And on so many levels, like, there's some really cool stuff coming out about the human gut microbiome and just breathing in healthy soil actually contributes to human well-being. Like you think serotonin, which is our happy hormone, 90% of that is made by um, gut, gut, gut biology. Um, they've invented a vaccine for PTSD that comes from a soil microbe, soil bacteria. So these things are actually contributing to well-being on that side, but also well-being in terms of food quality and in terms of not breathing in dust um, and obviously the whole planetary health. So for me, everything comes back to soil and soil microbiology and um, you're welcome to challenge me on that. I, I dare you. No. <laughs> kidding. Kidding. Honestly. Um, Right, so when we think about the soil health principles, there's a, um, there's a whole lot of them out there. I've kind of put some of them together to conglomerate it so we don't end up with um, 10 million different principles. But for me, the thing that's driving the whole system is our plant bricks photosynthesis. So what, what can we do to optimize plant bricks? And what can we do, what, what are we doing that's been dropping it? And what we find is, um, most operations that are disturbing by all those things I said that kill the fungi will also be lowering their plant photosynthesis, which means you're then lowering your capacity to dump sugars out into the soil environment, which is what's feeding all that microbiology and building all that soil carbon, building the aggregates, building water holding capacity. So um, we really need to look at what am I doing that's reducing that um, plant's ability to photosynthesize. We wanna make sure we've got year round ground cover and, and for some of us, I mean, even in the, the winter this year, we've got a whole lot of open fields. We still want to see um, good ground cover. I've seen a lot of hay guys cropping, uh, just cutting too low. And I know you're trying to put more, um, more away, but you're reducing your yield year after year if you keep cutting, you know, like below four inches. I know some of you that's really scary, but the lower you cut that, the more that we're exposing that soil. Um, and then the, the detriment that that's going to be is our soil starts to lose carbon. It starts to get very dry or um, evaporate, more moisture. There's all sorts of things that start to happen if we haven't got ground cover, right? We're going to reduce or repair a disturbance event. So sometimes we just do things. It's just what happens, right? We have horse pastures, good example of a high disturbance, or a fire comes through, or you're like, 
it got really wet and muddy and we just we just absolutely trashed it all right what does it look like to repair that or how can i learn from whatever i did so that i can reduce that kind of impact in future um, we want to look at maximizing that above and below ground biodiversity and biomass so that would include you know having livestock um, having a diversity of species uh, as much micro, um, microbiology, obviously, but also what's happening with our insects, right? Is there a, a whole lot of flowering plants out there? Are we seeing more food for our beneficial insects? And then I talk about addressing our limiting factors, and we're going to go into what those are, and they are in the book as well. What do you want to do, Laura? Do you, do you want to, you just tell me that we want to stop. You just go like, you uh, continue on. Um, I did go ahead and post, you had given me a, a good question to prompt some discussion in the chat box. And I, I posted that in the chat box. Um, and that is uh -huh. when you think of the history of land use and soil in your area, what factors have shaped the landscape today? And we have a couple of folks commenting on that. So any any oh. thoughts that you have on, on what we need to know or be observing about the historical land use um, to help us make better decisions for the future would be interesting to get folks thinking about that. Yeah, wait, how do I how do I get the chat? It's disappeared. I want the chat. Can you find it down at the bottom there along the bottom row? No, because I'm sharing my screen. It won't let right, me. that makes it tough. Show grid. <laughs> Can you read read something that someone said? I can. So uh, Graham says President Polk, um, Randy glacial, f Mandy glacial floods, um, pushing bush, draining wetlands, removal of diversity of animals and insects. Mm. Yeah, yeah, massive. You know, some of you are very lucky in that you are on some glacial, uh, what was once glacial ground. I kind of think like a glacier just comes in and, and over geological time is a great big massager and increases um, available nutrients. And yeah, we see some of the most fabulous soils on aged um, glacial ground. Um, so that's, that's a really cool observation to see that for yourself. Um, you know, you can actually buy ground basalt or paramagnetic rocks um, to influence land. Like they do this in Australia and New Zealand. They actually apply these um, glacial rocks, um, which don't seem like they've got a lot going on for them, but they create a whole lot of growth, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, and reducing that biodiversity, if that is um, wildlife, uh, not having the bison herds obviously coming through, um, but even just the insect loss of insect biodiversity is having massive impacts right across the ecosystems because they were the ones that were often bringing in nitrogen or phosphorus from other places. Or you think of um, bears eating salmon and then going up and I talk about in the book, like they do poop in the woods apparently. Um, by losing those bears, we're seeing tree systems, ecosystems falling apart because that phosphorus input is gone. You know, so it's really hard to kind of like we have to be able to go back in time somehow and think what were all the different nutrient inputs that were coming onto my land these weren't closed systems right so birds and guano the amount of um, nitrogen that a bird brings in is just phenomenal and especially if they're seabirds as well um, but even just um, normal old meadow larks or whatever are bringing in nutrients um, to the ranch a lot of the other comments, Nicole, are uh, farming, homesteading, the introduction of farming, removal of the beavers, the settling of mm. the prairies. Those all had had big impacts on the landscapes today and the soil underneath it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and think about beavers. Like they reckon there was a beaver for every acre across the U.S. And I'm trying to imagine how that worked, but I guess there were lots of beavers in some places. Um, but the rehydration, the, the hydration of the landscapes that those beaver dams create is absolutely phenomenal. I think we've got some people on the call that actually have seen this impact with beavers um, and seen that restoration of riparian zones from excluding, um, by excluding livestock, allowing those beaver to come back in and then seeing how far up a hill does that start to green up or how far back up the valley do we start to see that greening and returning of um, often grass species that we think of as locally extinct, which is kind of cool. Um, was there something else? Um, rivers dam to create reservoirs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if, if we could, Nicole, if we could go over the five M's before we kick people into breakout rooms, because um, okay. that, that'll be their first discussion topic. Okay, all right. So 
When I think of the, we'll just do the, these five M's. Um, so, you know, nothing really is original in the world, I don't believe. I think, certainly for me, I'm just a magpie. You know, if you've got something shiny, I'm probably going to collect it and add it into my story boxes. But so the five M's I've kind of developed on some other things I've heard from people and certainly what I'm seeing in terms of thinking of the triage in your soil. So think of the five M's as what is it that's putting a drag on my system or what is it that makes my ranch really successful, all right? So think of your mindset as number one um, and then your management as number two. And then uh, what's happening with minerals or microbes or organic matter. So potentially for many of you, um, that organic matter uh, might be your limiting factor. Um, your... If you're not sure sometimes about mindset, ask your husband and wife. They're often quite happy to tell you if it's your mindset. <laughs> um, so yeah, do you want to have a breakout and have a conversation about which of this, like, you know, is the microbiology working really, really well on your place? Like we get some of these um, adaptive grazing guys going to New Zealand and talking about you got to lay all this litter down and you got to, you know, have that trampling effect. If you have litter that continues to stay around in New Zealand, that's a bad sign. So our litter breaks down incredibly fast because microbiology is not our limiting factor as a general rule in New Zealand, right? There's a lot of microbiology. We've got temperate ecosystem. We've got good organic matter. So then often we look to what's happening with minerals. So I'd like you to consider which of these five might be going on at your place and have that as a conversation. Is that how you want to do it, Laura? Go ahead and drop your thoughts or comments or any themes that you heard in that session into the chat box. Um, so if, again, if, if there was a theme or a common uh, challenge or limiting factor or opportunity that your group talked about, tell us about it in the chat box and uh, any questions that you might have had. Um, there are quit now, can it? And Nicole, while folks are typing that in the chat box, I'll just share in, in our group, and, and I would ask our the ladies that were in my group to type more questions in the chat box too. But in our group, we talked about um, management and mindset and this idea that management takes so much time. Um, one of our one of our group members shared that, you know, there was a time where she thought that the best case scenario was to have the ranch run itself, right? That uh, as little management as possible was a good thing, but now realizing, gosh, no, more more is needed and better but how do we more intensely manage or make the time and energy needed to work on that management piece mm. i quite like caitlin's comment saying a best a big thing's education often the most limiting factor is everything you don't know <laughs> and i think you're pretty spot on um but I think, too, a willingness to be curious and ask some of these questions. And, and from some of the people I can see here today, like A.G. and Candice and Patty and Dale, you know, people that are really asking these, these questions and, and continuing to ask, you know, why. I think, I think really mindset is, for, for most of us, you know, that idea of, oh, well, this is how we've always done it. And that's not necessarily the truth. And we were talking about uh, the history of sheep here in Montana. Um, and how actually sheep can be a really powerful regeneration tool, but what changed really was then the smaller land holdings and not allowing sheep to, well, not shepherding sheep as such, but the mindset that's kind of then come along with sheep, that sheep are, you know, the bane of all evil and <laughs> the reason for the collapse of the West, maybe, um, depending, yeah, depending on our take on things. Um, so... Just push a button and all the little wonky stuff happen, but you know, that's all right. I just wanted to share uh, an example of, I guess, a case study of, of where it seems really insurmountable and a, um, to, to look at something and go, well, it's just not possible here. And, and I hear this a lot, you know, it's all very well that it happens in um, New Zealand, you know, it's really easy there, obviously, and it is a lot easier, um, but it's really easy in, um, Western Australia, I've even heard people say, and I'm like, hey, have you been out there? <laughs> um, so I just want to share this story of Old Spring Ranch. So hopefully many of you are familiar with these guys. They're on 46,000 acres um, near May, Idaho. Uh, they're certified organic, and they're practicing what they call in-herding, which is basically an intuitive herding process, but it's, it's basically shepherding. 
Um, and if you have a look at that ground there, what they're on is um, like a volcanic a shale and scoria, and it's a lot of rock. Like I really wore my horse's shoes down. Um, and I had the privilege of spending two months out on the ranch with them. And so to think about managing landscapes like this, um, people would say we can't afford the fencing, we can't do the water. And, and so they've been practicing this for six years. And before that six years, you know, they did have issues with riparian management. Um, yeah, and so the, what they're doing is they're basically putting a call out for interns. And this year, I believe they got 283 applicants wanting to come and live on this operation and basically you're living with the cattle um, and moving them every day. The, the girls have GPS in their saddlebags and we basically flow across the landscape. There's, a, there's 409 there in the herd right now, or there better be. Um, and uh, we go out one way and come back another. And um, water is pumped into some tanks so that they never go down into the stream. Um, and so we walk to a water source and then back again. In the time that I was there, um, it, it was extraordinary, but I was counting plants. Like what, what are the different species? What kind of species can I see? And in two days, just in two days, I counted 127 different species of plants and very few of them were non-natives. I'd say probably six, maybe at the most. And they were really just around disturbed areas. And what interested me in, in watching this was actually how the cows preferentially were eating forbs. So that's your broadleaf um, plant species and legumes. So they really, really were into the, into the milk vetch. Um, and actually when looking at their diet, they were probably eating more forbs than they were eating grasses. Now we set up some transects and looked at um, compar comparing what had been happening with soil carbon and organic matter. And in six years they've taken their um, organic matter levels from 2% to 4.6%. So that's a doubling of organic matter. Now you would think looking at a landscape like this, that that would be too challenging. But what they're seeing is that green up, we're seeing the beginning of an aggregate of these ash soils. Now these are not, these are not easy soils. But if you could extrapolate that for, if you can do it on landscapes like this, so very, very low, low rainfall, then anything is possible across all of the US and across all of the world. Um, and really what's, what's, what I guess is supporting them is the ability to get these interns. But there is now a whole generation of young people, as far as I can see, that are becoming very engaged um, with getting back into nature. Or what, and you know, the story that these people have to tell in terms of regeneration um, their meat quality, you want to taste, you want to taste one of their steaks. Even if you've got the best steak in the world, I, I challenge you to go and grab one of their steaks and do a taste comparison. It's just absolutely extraordinary. So that mindset of it's not possible, what can we do in a landscape like this? These guys have really actively found a solution that's working really well for them. Um, I'm not saying it's an easy ride. Um, I'm not saying it would be economic either if you were, had full 10 full-time employees, but you could probably, Candice is on the call, she reckons her and her husband and a few dogs could do this, um, not necessarily have all the, the people power. And also um, seeing some of you there on the call, there are the new um, e-shepherd. So the, the electric collars in order to um, flow across a landscape like this. But um, yeah, it, it was truly, truly inspiring. And it's that rethink of how do we manage some of these landscapes? Does anyone wanna ask a question about this place while I'm here? Is there questions on that? Nicole, not particularly. Oh, well, um, Kayla has a question. How much precipitation did you say they have there? I can't remember off the top of my head and I don't want to make it up, but it's pretty low. Um, yeah, it might be like eight, nine inches rainfall. It's, it's yeah. They say when um, colonial colonial space came out here, they found um, very little wildlife um, and only very small mobs of bison, like 20 head. It wasn't, it, it's not a landscape that supports huge numbers of even, um, of large mammals anyway. Mm. Yeah. And another question about um, if they were dealing with invasive weeds and then another on um, organic matter gain on public grazing allotment. Mm. So yeah, the, um, a lot of this is public grazing allotment, so they're doing that carbon 
which is a, it's a good question of thinking about carbon markets. Who owns that carbon is probably the government. I hadn't thought about that. Um, what was the question before the carbon question? Um, do they have to deal with invasive weeds? Not really. So any, any place that we were seeing invasive weeds um, was where they'd had a fire break um, put in, uh, any, anywhere that there were tracks, um, you know, vehicle tracks that was, and anywhere that people had herbicided. It's so interesting. You can see where the herbicide's gone because that's where all the cheap grass was. Um, <laughs> but when you're out into the open um, grassland area, no, not really. I mean, I saw a couple of knapweed and I saw the um, loco weed in some of the meadows, but they're not having any issues with livestock even eating um, fairly high concentrations of that loco weed. Um, not loco weed. What's the white one? Oh, this one. Anyway, yeah. Okay. So uh, I noticed that in the chat box, a lot of the groups were saying that the most limiting factor was mindset. Can you share maybe mm -hmm. in using this as an example or others, other examples, was there a, mm -hmm. a turning point that helped change a mindset perspective or what is the turning point often that helps us mm -hmm. move into a different mindset? Yeah, and it, it's, it's really good. And it was part of what prompted some of the stories in the book was I wanted to identify people that weren't, they didn't change their mindset because of a health crisis. Like I was like, okay, some people, you know, when you're up against the wall and you run out of options, then people change. And I, and I, that didn't happen to me. I didn't have this moment of like, ah, I'm going to die or go bankrupt. So I've got to change. So a lot of people in the book, I interviewed them because they weren't motivated by a massive like force. It was, you know, asking that question of, how could I do things better? Or maybe, you know, having a really hard, there's a lot of guys that I've met that, and I'm going to say guys, I mean girls too. Um, a lot of guys that have met that their motivating factor has definitely been um, like having drought after drought after drought, and then going, I really need to shift how I manage. But uh, for these guys, they were, they were losing um, maybe 20 head uh, to wolves. Um, so the year that that happened, the following year was when they made that decision to actually, we need to have people up there. And because um, Carol Elzinger um, is a PhD botanist and her husband, Glenn Elzinger, is a forester with all this experience as well, they brought together a lot of that science and understanding of how the natural systems work to ask that question. So asking that question when you're out here is like, what is the potential for this landscape? You know, have you got stories? Um, you know, we were tying grass over the back of the saddles, you know, what, what stories can you find of your particular landscape and think, I wonder why, I wonder where that resilience has gone, where those grass species are gone, and then how can I align myself more with to actually bring that species diversity back? These guys haven't planted anything, they haven't put any inputs so in, the only inputs is animal impact and very, very light grazing. Like it is a it is a total movement across across these landscapes. So often these plants potentially only been grazed every three or four years because they get missed, you know, as animals are coming through. So I think to ask the why questions, um, you know, why do we do black cows? <laughs> Sorry, but you know, like, how do we ask some of those questions of things that we just we just take for granted? Um, and then how does that limit us and, and, and what's the potential or what opportunities do I have out here? Um, you know, I know people that really have diversified their income streams off farm. And actually we've got an interview with um, the Grassfed Exchange, they call it the hallway conversation that will be on Facebook on the 24th with, um, with Julie James Ott, who, you know, returned to the family ranch under the proviso that every child that came back to the ranch needed to create their in, own enterprise. And so they've got four children, 16 grandchildren, I think, and the two parents or one parent now um, who are managing this ranch. It's only 400 acres and the kids are like doing dairy, doing pigs, doing chickens. Uh, they're running a restaurant. Um, they've got all sorts of tours going on. But just asking that question of why is it we only do cow-calf operation when we've got, you know, 20,000 acres and, you know, the calf market's terrible. Um, you know, we have uh, plants like Arnica, you know, it's Arnica Montana is used all over the world and it's a native plant to Montana that you see freely growing in many um, of these rangeland environments. That's actually a, a really valuable crop. Um, 
So just starting to ask, ask some different questions and, you know, maybe you just want to do cow calf. That's cool. But um, I think there's other enterprises and other opportunities because we're just treating everything in, in the commodity market and it's come at the cost of our land. That's been the, the outcome of, of commodity and cheap food is we've, we've taken everything we can out of these systems and, and now they're on their knees. You know, and talking to um, a representative from the Australian government in agriculture, and she was saying, if you know, Western Australia doesn't start to um, use regenerative practices, there will be no more farming in, in Western Australia in the next 10 years, which is pretty dramatic. And I, I don't know if I agree with that, but I think the fact that you've got policymakers that are really, really quite frightened for agriculture, um, we need to be building resilience. How do we get resilience? We need to start working with nature and turning on these signals for these types of species to be germinating, right? Instead of what are we switching on right now? And, um, you know, we're seeing the encroachment of incredibly invasive weeds into many rangeland environments. Oh, I went down a rabbit hole, sorry. <laughs> Quite all right. <laughs> Quite all right. A good rabbit hole to go down. A um, uh, <laughs> few very specific questions on the topic of this particular ranch, and then maybe we can go into the next breakout room, Nicole. Um, yeah. But the questions were how many days graze period and what were their rest period? And, and you kind of answered that in that last topic, but I thought I'd give you a chance to, to talk a little more about that. So when you see the cattle up in the top left, or even in this image, that's the total graze period. The amount of time it takes for 400 head to move across that at a walk. And then they may not be back again. It might be next year, it might be the year after, it might be three years. Uh, some of their areas have had six years of rest. Um, what's interesting in the cow camps, so where we um, come in at night, is you can still see those areas six years later and they're full of wild basin rye, which I know AG and Vicky you're very familiar with, um, dense with wild basin rye. And it's the only place you really see it um, growing is where the cow camps are. So that was kind of interesting. So yeah, that recovery period, if you think, if you look at that grass right in front, you see not every grass has been actually bitten. Um, and watching them, I often would kind of be like, it's only every, every one in four plant or, plants that have been bitten and they'd be 50% would be gone. Um, so they take half and then they're moving on. So very, very light grazing. Um, and, and these are brittle landscapes, right? This is, this is, this one here is scoria, but many of those faces that you can see in the distance, it's all ash and pretty deep ash. Um, you know, and some of this ash is where they find like, you know, the rhinoceroses and the horses and the camels from like, um, 24 million years ago. So, you know, big ash fields. So not a lot of water holding capacity happening in here. So yeah, it's it's closer to what would have happened in this environment in nature. And then think about what would have happened in yours. Was that a million pounds an acre that didn't come back for a year? Looking at some of these um, buffalo jumps, I'm, I'm often kind of wondering, do you think the big mobs of bison were coming through every year? Or maybe they're chasing where it had been, uh, where the green up was. And so they may have actually gone up another valley um, or to the left or the right. You know, you can see some images with satellite where there was concentrations of bison year after year. But I think in a lot of places, um, I think we, we may not be correct in thinking they came through every year. Um, and there's no way to, there's no way for us to really know that but anyway yeah was there another question on that i think that covers most of the questions on this topic in particular mm -hmm. um if we want to jump into the next breakout room then we'll open it up for just a general q a if that's okay with uh -huh. you nicole lovely all right great so our next question for the next breakout room is what actions have you taken or seen others taking that are making positive steps forward in your soil or plant health. And um, so while folks are dropping those in, Nicole, I'd love to hear what are, what are your thoughts? What are the easiest first steps that someone can take to start making improvements in that area? Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's a good question. And I, and I think um, that where to start, oh, Graham's like, I need 10 minute breakouts. <laughs> All right. Um, that, that place to start um, is this curiosity. It is having um, meeting sessions like this. It's talking to others. Um, actually, I'll share this slide because that's probably the one way I can, I can do that. 
Um, you know, because it's the, it's the biggest thing is starting, especially when, um, you, you know, it's, there's no one road or one way to, to do this at all. And so it, it becomes very much like, there's so much that we can do. And I know um, some of you old dogs pointing at myself probably, um, you know, we get used to, we, we know what we know, and then it, it feels hard to start filling in that bucket with, with more information. And especially, you know, some of this stuff about um, soil microbiology can seem really overwhelming. Um, and I totally empathize. Um, but it does start with this education. It does start with observations. Um, you know, and these take home messages on the side was some studies looking at agroecological farming um, and, you know, really looking at, it, it is it a complex learning system? So it is getting together. I talk about the biological barbecues were probably the best things that I did um, in my life in terms of really learning. And we would get together, I think in the early days, it was like 19 of us. Um, and that gradually grew in number. And we would every six weeks go and meet up on each other's farm and dig holes and look at what was working, what wasn't working. Um, look at the worst of the livestock, the best, um, what people were trialing, cover crops, all of that. And nowadays you can do a lot of that on WhatsApp or, you know, some kind of technology. But for me, really being in, in each other's fields was so valuable. Um, and that add-on idea is like there's some kind of silver bullet or just one thing that's going to be. And that's why that 5Ms is so important for me is that it's not necessarily just management. And, you know, you can go to grazing courses and get told that, um, grazing will solve everything and and in some landscapes that's true and, and in some landscapes it's not and so you really need to figure out is management really the main thing that's putting a drag on this system and you think we are walking into um, many landscapes that have been degraded for a really long time um, what has been lost and then what is it potentially we may need to put back and in some places all of that is is your grazing but it's not not thinking about grazing like a silver bullet all right, what is it that works in your local context? Um, and really it is you guys that are the experts. So that observation is really key for me, education. And then, you know, you know your management and addressing limiting factors are next. And so when I talk about limiting factors, that first one is, you know, photosynthesis. How well is that system working? Because without it, then you're not going to feed microbiology. Uh, we won't see that response in biodiversity. Um, and further up the pyramid we go but yeah if that sunlight energy is not working um, and then mindset obviously is at the base of this so your mindset um, alters what you even observe you know do you observe a weed to kill or do you observe um, healthy nutrient dense forage for livestock um, and if we just see it through that observation or that mindset of um, I need to control everything. And this is where I think we have a lot of anxiety in, in ranching and farming is that belief that you can control anything. Um, we're in agriculture. So much of it is out of our control. Um, how is it that we can work in that sphere? Um, and, you know, I do see a lot of anxiety and stress because so much of this is out of our control and trying to control it is a, is a fallacy, right? We've got to look, how do we work in with, with nature cycles? So I guess, that, that triage for me is, is looking at, at sunlight first. And so if we were gonna start anywhere, the next step is air movement. Are we seeing the cow pans? So if you dig a hole, do you see a compaction layer in that top inch? And if you do, that's actually the number one place you need to start looking. All right, what is it that's actually gonna break that cow pan apart? Has it been my management that's formed it? Or if you've got a plow pan, was it my management that, that created that? Um, or is it a lack of plant diversity that's not enabling that soil to kind of open up? Because if air is not moving and your soils are compacted, uh, then water's not going to get in, which is the next place to start. You know, so if you do infiltration rings, do we see water moving through? Many of you have probably got um, the cryptogams, so these um, moss liverwort communities, lichen on the rangeland. Um, some of them are really good at absorbing water, and some of them actually create soils that are water repellent. Um, so take a look, you know, is my soil actually water repellent? And, and a lot of this, the answer to getting air and water movement through is, um, is organic material, right? So bale grazing, um, buying cheap or even getting free waste material. There's so much organic material that's wasted in agriculture that's sitting in someone's um, 
it's stockpiles or it's um, waste from sugar beet or it's um, barley stubble or whatever it is, can you get some of that stuff free or cheap and actually start um, throwing stuff out, get your animals to, to, to compact, um, not to compact it, to trample it into the soil and then look at decomposition. So if you find that, okay, my soils are very well aerated, water's moving in really well, but I've got cow pets that are 10 years old. Right. If I put stubble out there, it does. You know, it's not going to break down. Um, those bale grazing circles stay there for like 20 years. Um, then we need to have a look at what's happening with decomposition. So there can be different actions that we would take depending on what's putting a drag on your system. So there's no one place to start because you're going to start where you are right now, right? So um, and you're going to start where where you've got the time the money or the um, understanding of it. So this is kind of why I wrote the book really, so that we could, um, to be able to answer that question. So I can't answer it just in like a one step of like, yeah, you just need a magic silver bullet. Hi, Amber. Um, <laughs> and that's all you need. Um, oh, this question, very good. Yeah, so I thought we would have um, just a, a relaxing, oh, someone asked a question about monitoring. Can right. I? Can yeah, I? please, please do, Nicole. I was going to say we have a lot of very specific questions that we can get yeah. to, but I want to open with this very large question of an M that wasn't in the five M's, but it's monitoring. Um, and maybe you yes. can share what are some like what are the top three tools that someone can use to start monitoring and measuring mm -hmm. some of these other items on a ranch? Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, yeah, so I mean, the best thing to start monitoring with is probably just a camera. Um, so starting to have photo points, um, starting to just build your observation bag, really. So that, um, for me, part of it's putting our money where our mouth is. If we say, yes, we are regeneratively grazing or we are holistic or we are building carbon or whatever that is, you need to be able to demonstrate it. Otherwise, we're greenwashing just like the big companies are doing. So part of what we've done recently is we've just released what we call the Regen platform. So this is a, a soil monitoring um, app that has, like it's just, it's got this the most incredible um, list of um, plant and soil monitoring that you can do directly in field um, for yourself. And you don't have to fill them all in, but at least we can start to monitor. Um, I think if I had to say like, um, what you know what what um what's my number one there's a couple of things that i think are really um quick and easy that we can do in field um one of those would be just doing infiltration all right um the other one would be what we um we call the slaking test or aggregate stability because it tells you so much um let's see if i've got it on the app here i do Right, I'll stop share and then I'll share my screen. Um, can you see, can you see? Yeah, you can see. So this is the app, what it looks like in action. But on one of these options, can you see that? Mm -hmm. We can see it, yep. Okay, all right, I'll stop repeating myself. Is um, the soil slaking test. So in there it, it rates, what, what, is it, what, is, what does slaking even mean? And you see there's a little I, I push on the I, and it tells me how to do that slaking test. And then it tells me what are those results, what do those results mean? So you basically got a little scientist in your hand that's gonna help um, you work out what is something that I can do and it's immediate. You don't need any technology to be able to do it. Oh, you need the phone, but, um, and we've all got those, although some of you don't have very smartphones, I know that. Um, and so a slaking test, basically, I talked about fungi being one of the key organisms that really stop soil collapsing and falling apart. So a um, the slaking test or the aggregate stability test basically gives us an indicator of how well a microbiology working to, I mean, you think microbes are releasing stuff all the time, like they're exuding sticky glues, I kind of think of it like they're pooping and peeing and vomiting and all sorts of stuff and they make that soil stick together and they want that soil to stick together so it doesn't collapse when you get a heavy rainfall event, they don't lose their homes. Um, and so an aggregate stability test or the slaking test can very quickly tell you 
how well is my microbiology working? And you'll see it too, because if you've got surface crusting um, or you've got a lot of um, club moss, that's telling you that that, that soil biological system has fallen apart, right? That, that aggregate stability has fallen apart. I know a few of you are on those soils and I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's quite a quick test. And then I think the infiltration test would be the other one that are nice and quick. Um, and digging holes, so taking photographs, looking at how deep are those roots going, you know, thinking about what the prairie soils would look like, you know, 20 feet deep. And when the, um, when they came in with the plow, the sound a mile away sounded like someone cracking a bullwhip. I mean, imagine those rooting systems and they have all gone, you know, you, I, I can't think of many properties that have seen rooting systems like that. So, um, you know, dig holes, how deep are those roots? Are they, have they got that um, Rastafarian dreadlock type structure on them? Or are they naked roots and very shallow? And unfortunately, most ranches I go to, um, this is my Aussie accent, you're an inch from a drought, mate. See how different New Zealand and <laughs> Kiwi accents are, right? So you're an inch from a drought. And, and this is where most ranches currently are at. And it's terrifying. And you wonder why we've got no resilience and why we dry up so quick why soils are blowing away, right? Digging holes to just even have a look. Um, you might have like quite a big difference in um, soil pH even, or there might be something going on with compaction. So one of my favorite tools really is using livestock to get seed out. So feeding, feeding seed to livestock, or if you have a no-till drill, actually drilling seed that we um, uh, Bio prime. So by bio priming, we're talking about either vermicast or compost, or like the Johnson Sioux compost, or there's commercial stuff that we can put on the seed. That actually means when that seed grows, it can punch through with by building that riser sheath through, say, um, you know, soil that's got different pH or a soil that's high in sodium or aluminum or whatever it might be. Right. So by bio priming a seed, we can really help to overcome whatever that limitation is. So yeah, if you've got the ability to do that, I think it's, it's really worth your while. We find with putting seed through cows um, that the older varieties go through better, harder seeds go through better. Um, we're getting some pretty good results with, with um, pubescent wheat, um, which is a really hard one to get to germinate, but it's gone through cows really well. So I, for me, that's kind of a no brainer. So we're doing like between one, maybe one to two pounds an acre um, into a mineral box to, to actually see um, quite a dramatic um, response above ground. Um, and then that's going to help to open soils up. So um, I always talk about chicory because I love chicory, but I know it's illegal in some places. So you didn't hear that from me. But if you can get chicory, it goes through cows really good. Um, and with its massive taproot system, we can really start to open soils up. Um, yeah, if they, if they have been um, compacted. So really looking at how do we, Let's, let's take a look, dig a hole. Have we got compaction? Have we got these layers? Have we got very fine blow away soils? You know, the stuff that's growing above ground often is a really good indicator for what's happening below ground. So, you know, if you have got a lot of cheat grass, ventanata grass, medusa head, Japanese brome, you know, your so that's telling you that your soils are very bacterial and that whole system starts to fall apart. So don't take my word for it. Do the slaking test where you've got a whole lot of cheatgrass and you'll see those soils just collapse. All right. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm rabbiting. What was the question? You're doing great. Um, I did go ahead and put links to your website that lead people to yep. step by step on the soil infiltration test and the slake test. Um, so yep. there's some great resources there. Um, you know, a little bit along the lines of monitoring or being, being able to measure. Um, we had a question about uh, vermicast or other products that you mention in your book um, and where to find them and how to know if they're of quality. So how do we mm. know that, again, if we're using um, some of the different amendments that you uh, talk about in the book, how do we know if they're mm. good of quality, doing the job, et cetera, yeah. and how to source them? Mm -hmm. We're... Um so the, the question came from the Pacific Northwest and there is lots of vermicast um, on the coast because the marijuana guys love it. So you shouldn't have any trouble finding vermicast. Um, 
but I would always, always ask for a biological test and that includes compost as well. And what you wanna see is a lot of diversity and I wanna see at least equal numbers of fungi to bacteria, if not more fungi um, and, and good nematode numbers. And so, yeah, you want as diverse a biological product as you possibly can get. And most of the commercially stuff is just bacterial. You don't want that, you've already got that. Um, and so, yeah, working with a supplier, if they can't provide that, um, yeah, really asking them to lift their game. Often it's annoying because you go into Google and you're trying to find these and it's probably page 10 or 20 that you're going to find the gold because it's the, the big commercial guys that are um, closer in at the top. But again, with Vermicast, if you're only needing one or two pounds, um, it shouldn't be too hard to find. And it's so easy to make. You guys should all be making it. It's, um, you know, it's black gold. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I just think do it collaboratively. I've got some cropping guys in Australia. They're both on 30,000 acres and one of them's doing the vermiculture and the other one's doing, um, yeah, doing some of the, um, like that paramagnetic rock dust I was talking about, but they, they, they're collaborating and sharing this. So you don't have to all do it all by yourself. Um, yeah. But you've all got waste material, you've all got hay and manure and food scraps or whatever that could be feeding. Oh, cardboard. Worms love cardboard. So all of that stuff. Um, <laughs> Amber, there's a really, um, there's a, a webinar that I did called the Worminar. And so if you Google Worminar, um, it's a whole hour and a half on how to set these up. So you can set it up from scratch on a large commercial scale. Yeah. And what amazed me, and this is part of the assumption thing too, is I thought the worms would freeze here um, and they do not. The worms do very well. Um, they actually work away over winter. So you can come in in spring and you've got a product that you can use, which is pretty, pretty cool. Oh, thank you, Laura. You're like a little <laughs> angel working behind us. <laughs> well, our, the, one of our last conversations in the book club was we think that worms are going to save the world because that yeah. seems to be the thing that just fascinates people and captures their attention to open up a door to other ideas. So super yeah. fun. I'm excited for the Worminar. Yeah. There's quite a few questions in here on, um, yeah, I guess cover crop and diversity. Um, yeah, I mean, cover crops, if you look at what a cover crop does, it actually addresses a lot of those five M's. So you've got something that's going to feed microbiology, that's going to allow air movement, that's providing diversity and stimulating um, biodiversity under the ground, um, adding a whole lot of organic matter. So I can see the real value of cover crops. Um, you just got to just don't throw all your eggs in one cover crop basket. We have seen some pretty big uh, disasters and how I kind of think about cover crops a little bit is a lot of your soils are set up for annual production right now. They're very bacterial, they're very primitive. So, um, you know, almost using your annual species in your first year or two of cover crops to start building that scene before you put the perennials in. And, and often perennials are going to be more expensive anyway. So um, oats, barley, Sorghum Sudan, if you can get it to grow, sunflowers. There is that brilliant um, cover crop um, calculator, uh, the Smart Mix cover crop calculator that's really worth having a play and seeing what, what will grow really well in your environment. And um, yeah, yeah, so I do like it. Um, so how to diverse a pasture that's had smooth brome planted in the past. Um, I think you could probably say that about a whole lot of different species that might include crested wheat, um, but just, you know, species that become very dominant. Uh, was I talking to you this morning? Anyway, some, you know, some of the guys on the coast have a different, you know, grasses that become incredibly dominant. Um, I would potentially graze them really hard, put seed in through my cow mineral and then direct drill with these bio prime seeds because what you've got to do is you've got to give that seed a competitive advantage. So I'd graze it hard and then I'd come in and graze it again after I drilled it, right? So just really knocking that that brome back but allowing something quite competitive to come in and the bio priming really gives them a competitive advantage over the existing um, pasture. And we have seen some really, really neat results moving away from monocultural grass um, yeah. So, Nicole, there were uh, quite a few questions that are up higher in the chat that I'll bring back up to you. 
um, that maybe we can get to. And these are fairly specific. I know you don't like to be prescriptive, um, so they're specific questions. So maybe you can answer them with a question or, or share your advice as you'd please, of course. Um, we've made some big changes to incorporate rotational grazing, but we are on a flood irrigated property. Is the flood irrigation mm -hmm. going to hamper us in the long run? What I am seeing is a lot of people are flood irrigating with hard water. And that's probably your biggest limiting factor more than the grazing. So we're seeing um, hard water is hard for plants. Many of you know this, like I've visited so many ranches and they're like, oh, I've got a black thumb and I can't grow a pot plant. And it's like, it's because of your hard water. So if you're over 150 parts per million, that's gonna interfere with, um, like you end up with soil crusting and it's just hard work for those plants. So um, not to say that you don't want to flood irrigate, but just there's challenges with it, um, obviously. Um, and so no, we can still graze, graze it. Um, I think a lot of New Zealand pastures are basically flood irrigated because we get such heavy rainfall. Um, and so then it's just looking at avoiding treading damage, um, pugging damage, because if you're going to do that, then you're going to need to repair it. So some of these guys that are flood irrigating, we're actually putting um, barrels of humate into the um, uh, where your gates are. So you can actually let that water flow through humate um, or flow through, um, I'm trying to think. You could actually make it go through vermicast, would be kind of cool. Um, but that that's actually going to help to mitigate some of the impacts of that flood water. Um, I think that actually people's water quality here is a very unrealized drag on the system. Um, yeah, and there are things that we could do. So if you've got pivots, at least you could put in a reverse osmosis or whatever you use. Um, yeah, no, flood again should be fine. Grasshopper control, net good or bad? Which kind of grasshopper control? No more specifics, although I would welcome whoever asked that question to type more specifics in um, the chat box. Oh, grasshopper net. I don't know what a grasshopper net is. You might need to say that what that is. Um, okay. Another, we can come back to that if, um, if you have more specific questions there. Um, thoughts on how to diversify a pasture that has had smooth brome planted in the past? I just, I just answered that one, Laura. Sorry, I missed that. You're fine. I was copying um, and pasting questions. No, multitasking. Um, there's one here about composting dead stock in the book. Um, I really recommend um, static composting. So please stop dumping cows into gullies, cool, coolies, cricks, whatever you're throwing them. Stop it. Stop it already. You could turn them into a really high value product. So static composting, actually, if you Google um, composting roadkill, there's some really good um, US resources on um, composting livestock. So basically a static compost, you've got one to two, well, probably two feet of, um, I would prefer bark, but you can just use like straw, um, bales, and then lay the body in the middle of it with a cow. You need to make sure that you puncture their guts so they don't explode. Um, and then you're going to build it up. If you've got quite a few um, dead animals, then you can build it like a Toblerone shape. Otherwise, if you've just got one, try and build it like a pyramid. And you're going to build that like five feet, six feet high of more wood chips, straw, whatever. Those things get so hot, they'll melt the rubber off a tire and all they'll leave behind is the, if they've got radial metal, they'll leave that behind, but they'll melt the tire. So I've heard people say that they reckon bones are gone within a month. I'm always a bit wary to put my hand in there and find out, but bones will go. It, they're really cool. So um, yeah, large, large dairy farms that I work with use that method. We've always used it when we used to have dead cows. Now I don't have any dead cows. I don't, I got two live ones if that counts. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, the um, static composting, Google roadkill compost and you'll find them on Google. Um, really, really great resources. Yeah, so you're gonna need quite a bit of carbon-based material but we've all got that straw, hay. Um, Dusty's asking about the grasshopper, it's a poison spray. Yeah, probably not great. 
Um, there is a, and the problem with it, we're going to spray and kill a grasshopper. We're also spraying and killing the 1200 other species of insects that are not hurting your crops. Um, and so I think, all right, what do grasshoppers indicate? Thanks, Candice. Um, so there, is, there are biocontrols for grasshoppers. Anything that lives underground for a long period of time is really telling you that soil systems are out of whack. And you think grasshoppers, I believe they live underground for eight years. Some of you might know, and it would depend on the species, but they, they've found that habitat because their natural insect predators are gone, right? Um, and so we've got these environments that are, the, the more compacted the soils are, the more insect pests we see like grasshoppers or cutworms or any of these invasive pests, they love compacted soil. So if you are creating the environment for compaction, we're creating the breeding ground for grasshoppers. And then they come up and they are hungry, right? And what they're attracted to are what we call incomplete or funny proteins. So it's plants that have not formed complete amino acids and proteins in their leaves. So something stressed that plant. Um, there's also a relationship with manganese and some other trace elements. Um, so basically, the plants are stressed, they're not able to complete nutrients um, in their leaves, and they ring the dinner bell for an insect, and it just happened to be grasshoppers. Um, and if it wasn't grasshoppers, it could be um, a fungal disease. So grass, uh, or all insects, they don't have a pancreas, they don't have the same digestive system to us, they are not attracted to the same food uh, as we are. So they're actually attracted to clean up garbage, and I know that's horrible because we've had big grasshopper problems and but it's telling us there's a whole lot of garbage out there because we have low organic matter we have low biological activity we have compacted soils and we're creating the conditions for the insects to come in and clean up um, so the way around that and I've seen aerial photographs of things like locusts swarming around properties that were working on building their organic matter that were doing really good grazing management um, that were addressing trace element issues um, to take care of it. Now in the meantime, because these things take time and it's really hard to kind of get a step ahead if you've got an insect cleaning you up, um, there are packaged what are called entomopathogenic fungi and they are in my book. Um, one of them that I really like is called Metarhizium. Uh, it's, it's marketed as oh, Meta something. It's actually made in Bozeman. Um, so these in, in Montana, these products are commercially available. They're a fungus that gets inside that grasshopper and kills it. Um, they are bee friendly. So they spray them on bees to control varroa mite. Um, and once you've got them in your soil and you're doing a really good job managing your soil, they will stay there forever, All right? So it's a, it's a permanent long-term solution. But yeah, if you're gonna overgraze, um, aridify, desertify your land, then they're, they, then they're gone, All right? But yeah, it's, it's um. It's a big picture, this, this grasshopper thing. It's not just a single component, but um, we're seeing plants coming under increasing stress. And the foundation to that is building organic matter, building carbon, um, really getting that system holding on to water and, and reducing stress, right? So it comes full circle. All right, Laura, did you need to say your magic? No, as we, we're going to get close to wrapping up, we want to be respectful of Nicole's time and try to wrap this up um, around 8.30. So if you have burning questions we haven't gotten to, go ahead and drop them in the comment section mm -hmm. and we'll wrap up shortly. So Linda was saying, heard of some ranches spraying milk, molasses and Johnson Sioux compost extract instead of poison. Um, absolutely. So what the milk does is actually helps to convert these funny proteins and humic acid will do it as well. You guys are close to some of the best humic um, supply, quality supplies in the world. Like we actually, in New Zealand and Australia, we get our humates, which are soft brown coals, from North Dakota. Can you believe that? All right. And so what those humic acids do in the plant is they actually help to convert these free, funny proteins, amino acids that um, are attracting the grasshopper. Um, milk would do the same thing. Um, molasses, if you're going to use molasses, just don't use too much. Like we're talking... Um, a cup, an acre, tiny, tiny. Um, and yeah, so I would believe that they are getting good results. Um, 
Connie gets her humates from Williston, North Dakota. That's the stuff, man. That's the stuff. So that's what we get in New Zealand. So funny. Um, yeah, so there are things that we can do. I feel like spraying, um, and, and I think if you were going to just target it, maybe target like that, at least a couple of hundred yards around the uh, around your perimeter of your property. You notice that the insects really do seem to come in at the edges. So let's just put up a barrier that's not sending a signal. So the plant's actually communicating to the grasshopper and signaling to it and saying, hey, I'm not doing well. Can you come and clean me up? Like the nature working and we we don't want it to send that signal and we don't want the grasshoppers coming in so yeah even if it was just a perimeter um yeah send them to the neighbors <laughs> okay i'll say fine final question from bill how fast do fed seeds move through the animal um well within hours yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you'll see them go through really fast uh, question, what's the best place to start for developing appropriate management practices for an area of five inches or less annual precipitation? Go and have a look at what Alejandro Carrillo is doing in the Chihuahua Desert. Um, I think that's, he's a really good starting point. Five inches or less? Um, I don't want to say, is, <laughs> is that really where you want to keep living? <laughs> but I won't say that. <laughs> Whoa. All right. Okay, Lori. All right. Yep. And I'd say we're, uh, again, I, we want to be respectful of Nicole's time. I know we could ask questions all night long, but we sure appreciate you, Nicole. It has been a real, pre uh, a real pleasure to have you and um, a real treat. So our next webinar will be with Dallas Mount from the Ranch Management Consultants on cool. um, cell grazing. So please look forward to that. Um, and uh, there's a lot of other resources that we put in that chat box. Um, and we look forward to having you in uh, North Central Montana in person later this summer, Nicole. So thank you again. And uh, we just appreciate you and the work that you do and the energy that you bring to um, this important work. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Great to see you. Have a good night.